Hi everybody, today I'm going to show some input uh, ORCA files as examples to show some different options for calculations. So this is an input file for a cobalt porphyrin that has an apical pyridine ligand and I'm going to describe a, a few of the keywords that appear here. So, for example, the first one is UKS. UKS means unrestricted CONSHAM. CONSHAM is the method by which a DFT is performed in most uh, electronic structure packages. It means it's basically it's a method where uh, DFT is done using a uh, atomic orbitals. Unrestricted is an option for allowing, I think I mentioned that before, to allowing electrons in alpha orbitals and beta orbitals to be uh, different. So that's necessary when you have any kind of open shell systems, like if you have spin one half or higher and you want to, to be able to describe it. So I mo mostly use UKS uh, directly, even if I have a close shell molecule, one that has been zero. So the next line is PV zero. So this is a functional. Uh, DFT relies, it means density functional theory. So you have different functionals which are a functional means a function of a function and basically tells there are different ways of calculating the energy from the electron density which is the basis of density functional theory there are different types of uh, there are many probably hundreds of different functionals and there are different levels of theory. There are, at the beginning, there were uh, LDA functionals, which are local density uh, functionals, which basically have a, an expression for the energy that, that depends on the density at each point. So those are older functionals, are more simpler ones but they are less accurate than modern functionals. Then you have generalized gradient approximation functionals, GGA, that uh, compose the energy from the value of the density at each point, but also from a derivative of the density. So basically, they give more detail on the particular electron density of that molecule. Then you have others like meta-GGA that in some way take into account the second derivative of the density. And there are many other uh, more specific options, but the most common functions sometimes are called hybrid functions. So the hybrid functions contain a, a certain amount of Hartree-Fock exchange. Hartree-Fock is another method that is uh, probably more uh, older than DFT. Uh, at least it's older than CONSHAM DFT and uh, takes has some limitations but actually takes into account uh, the exchange between electrons which are uh, spin one half particles and therefore have a certain property that's called anti-symmetry of the wave function I'm going to discuss that in a, a future video but basically, Hartree-Fock exchange is the correct way of handling the exchange interaction between electrons. So, uh, DFT has other ways of taking into account exchange interactions, but these are more, let's call them semi-empirical. And they, so basically, it has been found many years ago that mixing DFT exchange with Hartree-Fock exchange, which is exact, you get better descriptions of many things, especially properties of, uh, especially energy and other properties. So, PV series a functional that contains 
25% hard default exchange, and that's a good value for certain types of functions. I like this function because basically it has given me good results most of the time, and it's an appropriate um, balance between accuracy and uh, computational expense. Then there's this D3 uh, keyword, basically it's a way into, to account for dispersion interactions. I have mentioned this before. So you usually would like to have that in your input file because DFT doesn't normally take into account um, dispersion interactions very well. Then you have the basis set. So there are many, many types of the basis set, probably the ones that you have heard more about are the Popple style basis sets, which are 631G, 6311G or G stars, but actually those basis sets are quite old. They are newer and better basis sets. Orca allows to use many basis sets, but they sometimes they recommend themselves to use these types of, these are called Alrichs, uh, types basis sets if I'm correct and you have the def2 is because there are a newer version so there was a def1 before that didn't say anything so SPP means split valence and polarization it is one of the smallest uh, basis sets of this series you have some smaller ones or you can make them smaller by uh, taking out some functions but this is a I would call it the smallest practical basis sets for molecules which are useful. But that's just a personal appreciation. So after that you have a, you have another option, T set BP. That means tri triple zeta valence and polarization. So these are more accurate and more, more costly. Uh, so for now I my combination for geometry optimization is usually to use def 2 svp generally and if i have a metal here like cobalt i put def 2 tzbp on the cobalt and if i have other metals also and sometimes i, I would put this basis set on some specific atoms or molecules for which i for some reason want more accuracy in my opinion it's not generally if you're doing a geometry optimization it's maybe not such a good idea and, and unless you have a good reason to use an expensive basis set. Okay, so then there are all these keywords until here that uh, are basically different options that allow ORCA to... Some of them are, for example, Dev2J. There is something, there's a method in many programs called the resolution of the identity it's a method for mean, uh, doing an approximation for, cal for calculating two electron integrals, which are the, usually the costlier part of a, of a hard fork or DFT calculation, sometimes. And the resolution of the identity is a method for approximating those integrals and reducing the time of the calculation. So in order to perform the resolution of the identity approximation method, you need an auxiliary basis set. So besides DEF2 SBP, you need another basis set that is tailored for that approximation. So this other basis set is called, I mean, there are many that you can use, but the default that ORCA uses for these Alrex basis sets is called DEF2 uh, slash J. So I usually use this as a default. So you usually want to use the resolution of the identities, especially for the geometry optimization, because if not, it can be very slow. So there is another, so I'm missing one keyword here. This is the RIJ COS X. COS means chain, chain of spheres. And it is another approximation, which is somewhat, well, it's not so similar, but it to the resolution of the identity, but it's another way of approximating some integrals, which are integrals that 
uh, the resolution of the identity cannot handle, which are the exchange integrals. If you use a hybrid functional like PV0 or B3Leap or many others, you can use this approximation bridge, bridge cos x to speed up the calculation, to uh, particularly speed up the exchange part of the of the calculation. And that's also will give you great savings. But again, if you do this, you need a different set of options because the cos x algorithm does numerical integration over a grid. This grid has to be defined with grid x. x is for exchange. So the number that you put here, that I put 6, for example, tells you the accuracy of the grid, how many, the density, the density of points that you use around your atoms to numerically evaluate uh, the cos x algorithm. So the higher the number, the more accurate the, this approximation will be, but the, the costlier it, it will be, the more costly. So I think the, you can go from grid x4, 5, 6, 7, 8 until 9. So I'm putting 6 as a, somewhat as a, as a default, but I never... So I, try, I tend to put larger numbers than the defaults, but I have never done a, um, I have never done a systematic study of how some error in my energy changes with the uh, choice of grid. So I cannot tell you that these numbers are the correct ones. It's just something I feel like it's accurate enough. So then there is another, so no final grid X is something that uh, it's an option so that you would not use. It's just put it there. So then there is another, uh, another grid, which is actually a grid that you always have when you have DFT. DFT contains a term, unlike Hartree Fock, that is the exchange correlation a potential, which also can be also divided in exchange and correlation uh, potential separately. That's what uh, basically DFT has to in to take into account. That makes it better than uh, Hartree Fock methods. So that uh, correlation potential, that's the part that makes probably the functional uh, different from each other uh, has to be numerically integrated. So for that, you also need a grid. And this is the grid that you define here without an X. So you have grid two, grid three, grid four, etc. I, I think until grid seven. So I choose, and the, the higher the number is the more accurate, but also the more costly for the calculation. So I cho choose here grid six and final grid six which is basically it's saying that when you go to the end of the calculation, don't use your default, use the grid that I tell you to use. The option for small print is basically to make the output file smaller, print some information. Uh, output files can become very big, especially if you have large molecules. It, they can become hundreds of megabytes, even gigabytes sometimes, which is very difficult to to handle. Like opening a 200 or 300 megabyte file in a text editor is tricky. So I use TextPad here, which is for Windows, but I'm running using Wine on Linux. It has some shortcomings, but at least it usually doesn't crash with large files. That's why I use it. So then you have two options here, opt for geometry optimization and frequency for fre frequency calculations. Then here I have an option for CPCM. That's, that is a method for taking into account uh, solvent effects implicitly. And I have acetonitrile written that basically 
tells the CPCM method to uh, use certain the dielectric constant and refraction index, I think, of acetonitrile for certain calculations. So basically, it implicitly takes into account the solvent. For some things, that's good enough, but for others, it's not good enough. And I would argue if you're trying to calculate redox potentials or you're trying to calculate uh, energy barriers for reactions in which you have uh, either charged species or you have a change in uh, charge areas of, or mole of molecules, I would argue that it would be a good idea to try to use explicit solvation, actually to put many solvent molecules in your calculation. But that, of course, makes the calculation more expensive and also creates other problems, which are, which are basically, the question is, if you are adding enough solvent molecules to accurately describe your situation. So then here, this option for uh, PAL and PROX 16s, I'm telling ORCA to use 16 cores for this calculation, then I have some comments. As I said before, the basis uh, defined for, for COBALT, the triple set of basis set. Then I have some options for self-consistent field. What I'm saying is that you do, can do up to 500 iterations. if you. If it doesn't succeed in 500 iterations, it will basically stop the calculation. So, but depending on your system, also, it may your system may never converge, and that tends to happen sometimes. It doesn't converge because you need to change some other things, and increasing the number of iterations sometimes just doesn't help because your energy oscillates between certain values and never converges. So it's you have to put some maximum iter number that's reasonable so that your calculation doesn't run forever because it's better for the calculation to crash than to time out after two weeks of doing nothing useful. Level shift is L shift is some uh, also convergence uh, option that I usually have this as default but I can you can change it you can put 1.5 it's a it's a small numerical option that's used for uh, making conversions easier in the self-consistent field method. Then max core here tells me how much memory ORCA is allowed to use per core. So basically if I put 10,000 here, that's th this is 10,000 megabytes. So that's 10 gigabytes. And with 16 cores, I will use 160 gigabytes of, of memory. I use this because I know the core, the, the nodes in the cluster I'm using have this memory. I could use more if I wanted to, but this is okay for me. You have to play around with this value. First, you should, you should not exceed the memory of the computer, either your com personal computer or the node in the cluster you're using, because that will probably crash the calculation. And you should use what you need. So that's experience. So I know that 10,000 here is much more than enough. But usually you need more memory when you're using post hard refock methods like uh, CASCF with N NEV PT2, or if you are using other type of advanced wave function methods, you need more memory than for normal DFT. If you're using TDDFT, you may also need more memory. Or if you're using frequencies which are analytical frequencies, I have noticed that sometimes I need more memory. But this, this number is okay. You'll have to find it for your system. Then here, it is a, there is another field that also says CPCM. So it is uh, that I'm using um, inside the, C the CPCM method for implicit solvation, I'm using another method that's called SMD. That's, I think, um, solvation model based on the density, I think it means. And basically, it is another more accurate method to take into account or an option, let's say an option 
to, for using the CPCM method, that's usually more accurate than the, C, the, the standard options in the CPCM. Unfortunately, I haven't been studying very deeply how these methods work. So I just have searched some references to see what is recommended, but I cannot really explain you how these methods work or the details. So that may be for a future video. Then here there is the output. So this is done. I'm you can print into your output file a lot of information. There are many options in the Orca manual. So this allows me to print the basis set to tell the to tell, for example, if I'm going to visualize my uh, orbitals in a program like Avogadro or Chemcraft or another one, the program needs to know the basis set and needs to know the coefficients of the molecular orbitals. So you want to know your result. How, the, how do your molecular orbitals, uh, how are they composed from your basis set orbital? So if you print these things, you can uh, read that with Avogadro or Chemcraft or another program and plot the orbital. So I always have this as default. Then geometry, this is for the geometry optimization settings. So I'm basically using the, I am using, so in HES means that, so the HES is short for Hessian. The Hessian is the matrix of the second derivatives of the total energy with respect to all the nuclear displacements. So the displacements of each atom in the x, y, and z direction, that's the second derivatives. So you usually need the Hessian for performing geometry optimizations because that depends on the algorithm that is used. So for finding the minimum energy or the local minimum energy uh, geometry, you want to know the energy at each geometry, but you also want to know the gradient, which is the derivative of the energy with respect to all the uh, all the geometry, all the displacements of the atoms. And then you also want to know the Hessian, which is the matrix of the second derivatives of the energy with respect to all the coordinates. So with that, the algorithms, for example, newton robson or similar algorithms, find the uh, find the, the trajectory of your atoms to reach the lowest energy, at least the local minimum of the conformation or geometry of your molecule. So this option in HES means input Hessian and AMLOF is a, I think it is a, a model for a, producing a cheap approximation for the Hessian. You, if you have a, a complicated situation, you may want to calculate that Hessian exactly, which is done also when you request FREC, but FREC calculates the Hessian at the end of your calculation. So you can request that you calculate the Hessian exactly at the beginning. For more information on that, you can look at the ORCA manual and also the ORCA input library, which gives a lot of examples on geometry optimization, uh, search for transition states and many other things. So also I'm, I'm telling here that I'm using 400 iterations for the geometry. So in, if it doesn't convert in 400 cycles, it will stop. Then this is plots. I, I have seen before. I'm plotting the spin density and the electron density. And these numbers, 120 for dimension 1, 2, and 3, is basically the resolution of the cube file that I'm going to export. Then, OK, here it, there is the, the coordinates of my, of my molecule. I'm saying the charge is 0 and the spin multiplicity is 2. So this is one option, and I'm going to show here the result of the geometry optimization. So this is the it's a cobalt porphyrin with a apical pyridine ligand. There is some saddling, 
saddling is a type of distortion of pore fillings. And if I go here, I can see the orbitals because I use the P basis and P MOs option. Here it is. For example, if I want to see, this is the homo orbital, homo minus one, lumo, a lumo plus one. These are the typical Gauterman orbitals of a porphyrin. If I go lumo plus two, it tells me it's centered on the pyridine. Lumo plus three is another type of pi orbital of the porphyrin. Lumo plus four here, this is the one. This is a metal 3D orbital mixed. It's an anti-bonding orbital of the metal uh, dx squared minus y squared orbital and some of the nitrogen uh, p orbitals and also contains uh, an admixture with the pyridine orbitals. If I go in the other direction, I, this is the homo minus one. Then I have this dz squared orbital mixed with a lot of contribution from the porphyrin and forming some anti-bonding you can see here anti-bonding with the uh, pyridine uh, some of the pyridine molecular orbitals which is mostly centered in this p orbital in the nitrogen this is another d orbital is quite mixed Another d orbital also quite mixed, and well, I could show more. You should be careful when analyzing this type of orbitals because these admixtures between metal and ligand orbitals are not necessarily uh, the the only description. They may be. They may change depending on how you do the calculation. So, for example, I use this geometry as an input file, and these orbitals are input for CASE-CF calculations, which are complete active space self-consistent field calculations. And those calculations um, generate different orbitals. So they basically somewhat uh, decouple the metal d orbitals from all these uh, ligand based orbitals. Uh, some of them remain somewhat mixed, but depending on certain options you do, you can obtain some different orbitals. So you should not, you should be careful with which conclusions you obtain from orbitals. And you should understand that there is no unique way of. Uh, there are no unique set of orbitals. There are different choices of orbitals depending on different options. And what you can um, compare are observables. So in quantum mechanics, you have observables. Those are kinetic, uh, sorry, kinetic and energetic uh, quantities that you can measure which are expectation values of different quantum mechanical operators. For example, so I don't extend too much. The linear momentum, you can measure it. The kinetic energy, you can measure it. The total kinetic energy of, a, of, a, of something. Um, you can measure the, the total energy. You can measure the electron density, the total electron density. You cannot measure the individual electron densities of different orbitals. So that's because orbitals themselves are not observable. So you could measure the electron density of an orbital if you have only one electron, for example, in a hydrogen atom or in the hydrogen H2 plus cation. So then your electron density would reflect the orbital in which the electron is. But if you have many electrons, you can measure the total density, but you cannot separate the electrons into orbitals themselves experimentally. And you can also measure the spin density. Probably the experiment for doing that would be some kind of neutron diffraction. 
and well you can measure many other things you can measure thermodynamic quantities so if you're doing a calculation it's very important to have some result of the calculation that can be compared to experiment or can be compared to other calculations or to a series of molecules that allows you to obtain certain validation of your calculation don't don't just look at the orbitals and try to take out too many conclusions out, out of those particular mixings so now if i go here to i'm just going to show fast some other calculations so basically i am going to go faster here because this many of the things are the same so here i am using i'm doing a geometry optimization of another molecule a corolle i am using the rev the revised pve functional so before i use pv0 pv0 is hybrid that zero has something to do with the the, the name of the functional how how it is not the name how how it was it means zero parameters has no empirical parameters so PVE is a is the GGI uh, part of the PV0 hybrid function. So this is not a hybrid function, it's a pure GGI function, and therefore it is faster. And rev is is for revised because some parameter in the function has been revised and found to be better. So I'm using this version now. I used to use PVE a lot, but then I found a benchmark benchmark paper by Stefan Grimme and describes many functions i realized that the red pve usually does better so i i now use this for geometry optimization the options are basically the same but if you notice that i don't have rij goes x nor grid x options because i don't have that approximation now because i don't have any hardy fog exchange i have noticed that for my types of molecules uh, with gga functions they have problems converging so after trying many things i have seen that if i use slow comb which is some it's an option that basically use a damping method to make the calculation converge slowly if i use slow comb i get better results also i have noticed that for the kind of thing that i'm using right now i don't need the standard levels of uh, accuracy that orca has as defaults so i'm using loose scf which is lowers the thresh the thresholds for the self-consistent field conversions options so for these things i find it that for me it's good enough but that doesn't mean it will be good enough for you change try different conversions settings and trying different accuracy thresholds is a uh, something that you have to explore for your types of molecule and you need to validate that you need to do at least some calculations with better uh, accuracy thresholds so that you can confirm that you are obtaining results which are uh, equivalent they you may not get exactly the same energy uh, numbers but you should get congruent results so then okay opt and frick many of the options are the same here i have this option broken sim 1 1 because this is an open shell singlet uh, species so i am not going to go into detail here but the, this is one possible way of obtaining a, a broken symmetry solution it is a open shell singlet means that i have instead of having zero spin density everywhere i will have some atom or part of the molecule that has a positive spin density that means a alpha ampered electron and another region of the molecule will have a beta ampered electron the total spin will be zero or well yes the total spin can be zero the spin projection but there locally there are uh, ampered electrons so this is very common when you have certain transition metal systems so okay then again out output now notice that the, i have put slower max score that's just because you know because i know i don't need more so why 
use more resources from the cluster than I need. Then in geometry, what I did is change. I copy this from the Orca manual and I manually change all the thresholds, all the tolerances. So basically here at the left, after the at, at the right after the comment, I have the, the default values that I know from, from the Orca manual and I basically doubled all these values. So I made it because if I'm losing, using loose CF in the self-consistent field part, why would I get higher um, geometry thresholds? So why would I, I attempt to have an accurate geometry optimization step if my self-consistent field energy is has a slightly lower accuracy? But so basically I did this because after I had several molecules that after trying to converge them for many things, they would simply not converge or take forever or half of my jobs would fail because of lack of conversions either in the geometry or in the self consistent field. And then I noticed that for the kind of things I needed them, I didn't need so much accuracy because I am going to do single point calculations on certain geometries out of these. So basically I double all these thresholds and now everything goes faster and it's easier. I think that it's my opinion that Orca is a little bit conservative with all uh, thresholds and tolerances for calculations. So you may not want to uh, be so strict. So you can use these values if you, if you see that it makes your calculations easier. So this is again another I'm plotting spin densities and electron densities. The what I added here is besides adding the dimension of the number of points, I am giving it minimum and maximum values for x, y and z. So basically I'm defining exactly the positions of the points of the Gaussian cube. Where are those where are those points? And I do that because I have noticed that if you you can sometimes um, you can take the difference between electron densities of molecules in different oxidation states, for example, or in some other options. So basically you can, for example, you have a neutral molecule and you calculate its electron density and then you have you calc you calculate the first oxidation of that molecule for example just putting adding one charge and ch changing the spin multiplicity correspondingly and you calculate the electron density for the two molecules and if you subtract those electron densities you may know where the oxidation has taken place it's a little bit more complicated when you optimize both structures because if the structure changes then the areas around the nuclei in the atom are much in the atoms are way too much in the electron density so then basically it the the plot can look bad but i'm working on a on a way to to minimize that problem and use these electron density differences to to qualitatively show where redox processes take part so in order to subtract Two electron densities they should have the same number of points and the same x y and z start and finish so what i do is i perform different calculations defining the grid positions in advance so i recommend that you do this if you're going to calculate a series of molecules uh, or a molecule in different oxidation states then okay here is the molecule this is a i start with a with a this is a triplet a multiplicity and I use this because when you request for a broken symmetry calculation you first calculate the, the triplet or the high spin um, wave function and then the orca does some flipping of the electron electron spin and uses that, that initial uh, high spin calculation to guess 
a broken symmetry, low spin solution, and then optimized by self-consistent field method, that solution. So most of the times I find that it works, but it, there may be some cases in which this doesn't work very well and you have to be more careful. So what I'm using here, okay, this was a geometry optimization that I attempted to be slightly cheaper in, and this method here, all these options, I would say that they are very cheap so you can calculate the geometries. You can optimize the geometries of quite big molecules very fast. And here there is another calculation that's after the previous one. What I'm doing is I take the geometry that, that I optimized from the previous calculation and I run a slightly, or, or not so slightly, more accurate version. So I run a PV0, which is hybrid. Now I need the re Rij goes x approximation and stuff, and I use triple zeta basis sets on all atoms. So that gives me a considerably more uh, accurate energy. But now here I'm not doing optimization and I'm not doing frequencies. So I'm using the frequencies and the optimized geometry obtained at the lower energy, energy at the lower accuracy method, and then I calculate the single point energy at a higher. A theoretical level and then I combine those results to obtain a corrected um, free energy. So I use that method a lot because for my molecules it would be basically impossible to do all the geometry optimizations at this level of theory. So maybe I could do it for a couple of molecules but with the number of calculations I do this would take months. And basically all the other options are basically the same. So that was the difference. I, I can show you just a molecule. So this is a corolle with a water bound to it in, to the cobalt. There are some other waters and there's a pyridine that's close there. This is a part of a series of calculations. This uh, geometry by itself doesn't, uh, doesn't have much utility. It's just out of a series of calculations that I'm, I'm, I've been doing. So, okay, that is all for today. Thank you very much.